me my money. No, I said no. No, I want my money. I said no. I said no, Pop. Now get out of here. The legendary co-creator and producer of Sanford and Son and All in the Family, the late, great Bud Yorkin, today on Pop Goes the Culture. Hi, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another magical episode of Pop Goes the Culture. Today, part four of my five-part conversation with the late Bud Yorkin, the TV legend who gave us All in the Family and Sanford and Son. Today, we'll talk more about what it was like working on those iconic shows. Yorkin also discusses his thoughts about what makes a successful sitcom. Uh, characters and story and all that whole aspect of it, because that's, to me, that's endlessly fascinating. Oh, the, well, I've always thought a situation comedy, which, which is a half hour uh, play, if you will, is really, uh, really not like a normal hour show or a motion picture in the sense that those are usually three acts and uh, in a sitcom it's basically one act with its ups and downs and a climax and finally finishes as one act as a one act play and and i think that therefore you can't story has to be really tied up in character and if you don't have the character uh it won't be successful and it's usually the character one character against the other character in the sense of some abrasiveness where you can start to write a point of view of what one character believes, which is diametrically maybe opposite or a bit so of the other. And that's where you find it, you can do that in many ways from age difference. When you take, a, when you take a Fraser, there's an age difference. You have the father in there. So you almost bring, you bring in three levels of it. Uh, and it's very special in the sense that you've got to get clear-cut, uh, clear-cut characters that people like and that, that they can relate to in a strange way. And so I think almost all the shows that that I remember, the Mary Tyler Moore's and the Dick Van Dykes and and uh, Bob Newhart, and and then you come to the Frasers and the Curb Your Enthusiasm and all all the great the shows have really come from, if you look at it, from the characters, a very simple idea. I mean, it, I mean, Mary Tyler Moore is, was in a newspaper office, and you, you, everybody knows about a newspaper office. They've seen enough movies and read about it, so they knew what the operation was. They didn't know what the conflict was and what the problems were and what would happen. And that's what that could work upon, you know, and the same thing was... Uh, was great with the Dick Van Dyke show, what he was doing. And certainly on ours, I mean, you were the clear-cut, you know, Archie Bunker was a clear-cut character, so was Gene Stapleton was a clear-cut character, and Robbie was a great clear-cut character. Same way as Sanford and Son, you had two people who, who uh, father and son, who love each other, who can live with each other in a way and can't live with each other, but they can't live without each other. So you have two men, different generations. One, a very old man, kind of a uh, guy that has lived through everything, that character. And you have a, a son, but yet the son can't survive without him. So that's a very interesting relationship. And then as you get going, and the audience can buy those two, and then you can bring in other characters, and that's how you end up with a sitcom. Sanford and Son, another British import. And Sanford Son is another one. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, brought in from Sanford. Was brought in from England, and uh, uh, it was called Steptoe and Son. That, that was, a, and that again was two Cockney, a father and a son, and uh, that was it. Whose idea was it to bring in to turn it into a Fred, Fred, Red Fox vehicle? Well, that that's the the the. Uh, the woman who represented Burl Virtue was an English woman who, who uh, represented the the, uh, the writer who had the rights to uh, to All in the Family, which uh, which at that time wasn't called that over in England. And li uh, likewise, she was the one that that uh, represented uh, Steptoe and Sons. So when she said, "I've got a 
great one. We have already, we knew we were on the same wavelength, and we were very quick to get that. So we we took that show over to CBS. We had uh, all in the family on CBS, and they turned us down with it because they wanted us to, two of us to stick on all in the family. Wait for it to go another year, so you get go on the two of you, and then you'll take on one. And you know, Norman, I said, well, you know, why are we waiting? We don't need to wait. So we went across the street to to NBC, and that afternoon they bought it, I think, two days later, you know. And the one thing they did tell us that, uh, you know, uh, we didn't want it to be Afro-American. They didn't want it to be black. Now, in a junkyard, you're either, it's either owned by Irish, Jewish, or, or black. That's about the three. And maybe you put Italian. So you got maybe three or four different, but you better have that, you better have that kind of character for it to believe that you're in the scrap metal in the business. And, and so we did test two or three wonderful performers, but just not right, uh, Italian and, uh, and so forth. And, and finally, one night I was watching uh, Cotton Goes to Harlem, the movie Cotton Goes to and there's a guy, there's, a guy, there's an old man with a junkyard in that, and it was, play, it was Red Fox. And I said, Jesus, Red Fox, what a good idea. Who would ever think of him? And... Uh, and he was working down. He was working down at, in Las Vegas in the in a bar in the outside lounge, I guess you would call it. He wasn't even in the big line. And when so I, uh, so we got him up here. And I remember saying to him, "How would you like to do a television show?" And he said, oh, "Well, I love it. I love it." He said, "I've never been. I've never been in a studio. I've never been. In, nobody's ever gotten me for anything. I did one show. You saw that one, didn't you?" And he said, yeah, I said, yeah, that was all even outside, so I never got in the studio. He said, you want me to take my teeth out? He started, I said, no, you, know, you don't have to take your teeth out. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning. I said, well, we go to rehearsal, and, uh, and we did, you know, and, uh, and I, we, uh, we did it, and uh, it was on the air <laughs> that fast. How long did it take them to, for, to sort of get into the flow of the, uh, of, of the weekly grind of the... Who, uh, Red? Red yeah. yeah. He started off pretty easy getting into it. He he liked it and enjoyed it. But then he, you know, he 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 then had a tougher time with it, <laughs> whatever the, whatever his problems were. You know, we had we had you know problems with Red. We, you know, and, uh, he wanted a window in his dressing room. You know, and I said it's all right with me at the NBC. They want to put a rent. He said, well, I didn't come to work till they put a window in. So, you know, we said to him, you got to put a window in. And he said, geez, we can't put a window. It's a soundproof. It's got 10 layers of, of thing you know, where his dressing room is right beside Johnny Carson's. He said, well, Johnny Carson's got to live in. And, well, yeah, he was up on the second floor. He had a, he had a window. So next, another week, you see bulldozers in there, man. <laughs> and they're putting a window in for him. You know, so we had a lot of that, you know, and times that we stopped, you know, we had to take. He told me one time, I, one time, he said, the Red wants to see you, and we're just getting ready to go into a dress rehearsal with an audience. So I go down, and I, he says, uh, can I talk to you for a moment? I said, yeah. He said, and you know, I, I'm, I don't feel well. I said, oh, what's the problem? He said, well, he said, I, I don't know, I might have an ulcer. I said, yeah. Well, gee, how's that happen? He said, well, my, what my doctor told me was, he says, see, I'm not getting enough money. And we got all that nerve is just something because I'm not getting enough money. I think I got ulcers. So I said, oh, gee, I was really sorry to hear that. He said, yeah. He said, I think if I just can get some more money made in my stomach, I don't know, maybe that'll cure it. I said, well, I think you got to go home and kind of relax then. So I walk out in front of the audience and say, you know, can I have a show tonight? Oh, what, what? And I said, you know, he's got, he's got the flu and so forth. So we, we give you tickets so you can come back. And he was out. We then sued him. He was out for eight weeks till we could get him back. So, you know, there were problems with Dear Red. But I miss him, I must say. He was, he was genuinely a funny man. If I went through each of um, your most notable um, shows, What's the story that you've dined out on for each of them? You know, for each of your. Which are even the best shows that you're saying? Are the best? Uh, the most, uh, the most, well, well, these days, most people are most aware of, of Sanford and Son, what's happening in the family. Um, 
family, if they went through and sort of did like a free association, what would be what would be the story that you just like you just even to this day maybe you, this, you can't believe that such and such happened or the one that, that gets the best reaction? Well, one you know obviously the one on, on the family we had Sam Sammy Davis is is uh, was one that had great. Uh, you know, I had great uh, audience, and maybe some of the biggest laughs that I've ever heard, and particularly when Sammy Davis kept, kissed the Archie Bunker way. That was that was an explosion. <laughs> it was more than I don't know what it was called, but it was one of the biggest laughs I've ever heard. Who came up with that? I don't know. Probably I don't know Norman or somebody. I wasn't on that on the day to day level, so I don't remember who came up with it, but. Uh, we had one, I would say one of the best shows we had uh, on uh, San Francisco was uh, Lena Horn. You know, Lena came on and uh, he used to say, well, before I die, I want to see Lena Horn. So he finally, you know, called up Lena uh, Horn and said, would you come on? And she said, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd come on. And so she, she came on. We had a really wonderful script. She's a beautiful, wonderful lady. And uh, that that one has a little story to it too, but uh, that one, I would say, was one of the better one of the better shows that uh, people waited for because for Lena was such a, a polished diamond, and then opposite, uh, you know, Sanford or Ed, it was so different. What was the story behind that one? Well, uh, the story was that she finally she did come to see him. You know, and you're the, you're the great one. And everything he did, you know, she, oh my God, she, uh, oh, she would just uh, uh, turned her the wrong way, and, it, and each way it got funnier and funnier because, uh, you know, he was so, he was just so naive guy who'd been nowhere, would just surround it all. He knows that Lena Horne, he's heard her, heard her sing, you know, and that she's great, and she was in the first movie, and the, you know, and. The, and the, and he said, you know, to his son, I think she loves me. I think she likes me. We're, this is going to be this good. I may get a mother for you, you know. And she thought, you know, here he is with Lena Horne. So that was that was very funny. What was she like? Oh, she's a wonderful woman. She's still alive, isn't she? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I thought she was just just in a wonderful woman. It was wonderful. a funny episode where. Uh, where it was that split screen where Fred Sanford met Fred Fox. Do you remember that episode? Yeah, that was funny. What was that like? Did, 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 did you remember doing that one? Yeah, but I just uh, I just remember though the vaguely the show, but I know it's funny because they, they, they were sort of opposite characters. You know, it's hard. I don't. Some of them I don't even remember anymore. Isn't that funny? Because you know, so many start to come into your mind, and you try to remember which ones. You know which ones are really good. You know I could name a lot of them, and some of my, you know, I remember uh, All in the Family was a great one when he, when he, she got the car nicked, and he said we got to get a lawyer. You know that one. Peaches. Yeah. <laughs> she was a riot, Gene Stapleton. What was Gene Stapleton? She was just wonderful. She was just wonderful. She's a real lady, a real wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lady. Wonderful actress, you know. She's done such incredible work. That character is so far off from from what she is known for and what she was known beforehand. She's uh, she was just great, you know. I must say that was a very, you know, that was a great, very tight group. Even though uh, they were very individual and had their own, all the family was very professional. The rarity you had to do too many pickups. They usually were right on the nose. Boom, with almost like a a play, and then afterwards you may have to, they may blew a couple lines, but that was about it. Yeah, that, so that was a that was a wonderful show. I, you know, I I remember uh, good. Uh, let's see, good times was, was that that's on the show too. Mm -hmm. I loved that show. I thought that had I loved the mother, you know, Florida, <laughs> the, the name, uh, yeah. How did What's Happening come to be? Uh, you know, that What's Happening, I think, I don't remember everything about how that first started, but uh, somebody came in with an idea 
like it or wrote a book about it. I can't remember who it was. Something about young young uh, kids. And I know there's another person uh, that was involved with it. Uh, not involved with that script because Saul Turtletown and, and his partner uh, wrote the... Uh, Wrote the pilot, and I'm trying to think. Who Is there a movie or something? Yeah, a movie. That's Cooley High. Or Cooley, High? Cooley High. That's what it was. Oh, you got that. That's that's right. Cooley High was was based on a bunch of kids in a high school and so forth. And that's and whoever wrote Cooley High, I can't think of his name. Uh, he came in and pitched it, and uh, and uh, and that's uh, where the original idea started. And I remember we did that show, and Fred, another time Fred Silverman came in to watch it, because uh, he was at ABC then at that time. And uh, that was another one of those shows. The pilot was just incredible. I thought it was one of the funniest, and everybody was, you know, we really fine-tuned it. And uh, that was another one of those things when it was over, Fred says, you're gonna lock, we, you know, you're on. Later on, I'll tell you that right now, and we'll we'll put you in on a night, you know, a good night for you, and that was it. And uh, you know, it was wonderful for me. It was interesting because for a year, if, all the time, I mean, but in the thing, you say, if he's black, he can write white, and certainly if he's black, he can write black. Let's not be. We don't care what color his guy's skin. If he can write. Let's get his ass in here, and we'll, and we'll, and he can be part of it, right? Now we get, we get killed by, by, NAACP or somebody who says, yeah, but you got a show on the air. We've had this on several of our shows. You got shows on the air, and you got one black writer, and they're all whites. Now you come to, to what's happening. We went out of our way to have almost a, a pure, many young black writers, uh, God knows there are enough that can write funny. We brought them in. And now they say, well, it's all too hip and too black. And well, we don't all talk like that. We don't do what's up and all the stuff. And the guys you say, whoa, you know, who can write? You know, it's no good if the, if the, if the black man writes the African-American writes his language, that's not good enough if he does. And if he doesn't do it, you're nailed. Why don't you? He's the only one that knows how to do that. So it's the same. Those are the problems you you run into with with uh, sensitive areas when you're taking, uh, whether it's a Latino show or a black show or a, an Irish show or a Jewish show. It's why... In very, people don't want to touch it, touch them because they're afraid you're going to offend somebody because you don't have, you've done too much. If you do Jewish, you, you make their accent too strong. You know, that all Jews don't talk. Well, certainly all blacks don't talk like these cool hip kids. Nobody said they, they did. You know, they, those three kids were all bonded together, come from the same area, doing the same kind of cool talk, and it was written by, and it, so. But then you know that offended. Uh, many blacks said, we know every child doesn't talk like that, real cool and hip. Is there a difference on the set of each of these different shows? You know, if you're running a show, obviously you're sort of set a tone, but was there a difference, say, from All in the Family to Sanford to what's happening? To sort of yeah, I think they're, oh, yeah, they're all different. Sure they were. Well, I mean, if you think what's happening, you had a bunch of young kids who had never, this is their first break, had never done any professional Things. Almost everybody in that cast, I don't think did any ever did anything, but maybe one Thomas, the, the kid that played the, the the older brother. But the rest, the mother Mabel Mercer, she played. She obviously she'd done so, but that was the rest. So you had you had these guys that that all of a sudden had stardom. You know, it's a dangerous thing when you have stardom and you and people are waiting for your autograph and so forth. And you know, and you've never done anything, never had this happen to you. I don't care if you're a kid or you're older, but that that is difficult, much more difficult than when you have someone that has had success or experience, then they know how to approach this. You know, and my uh, my theory always was well, Normans too, to a great extent. We thought early on the best way to go would be to take theater people 
who played in front of a live audience because we were doing live shows much better than than actors who have only done television or didn't have that experience because there is and and so in answer to your question are di- are teams different or or, or cast different yeah they are different because it depends on how professional they are depends on how you know how how the star is in a way you know you look at a bob newhart he can stay on for five six years because you love being with bob newhart he's a he's a dear gentle wonderful man and and they had a, you know, Susie Plachette, and he had a great relationship. I think all in the family, all professional. They may have not loved each other all the time, but they were very professional. He never had a problem with them. Uh, Red uh, was unique in his own way, so there were problems in and out, but not necessarily with the cast as it was, you know, with Red. I think he'd gone all these years and finally got his day and son, and, you know, he was... He, he was enjoying it, <laughs> and sometimes, you know, it takes a, t- a tremendous amount of, of concentration, and you get worn out from doing that stuff every week. But they are different. They are the the shows are different. The cast, uh, for the most part, I I think we had wonderful cast that we were that I enjoyed being around, and uh, and I I love actors. I just I can't imagine how they do it. I really don't know how they do it. I think, you know. Everybody can get, director can get hit by a car and the show can go on the air. And everybody else can get hurt around. But somehow, you know, if you don't have an actor, you're a dead duck. And uh, so I really, uh, all my life, I've, I really admire, I admire the person that can get up in front of a camera and uh, have that, can do what they do. Have you had to do it? Have you gone in front of a camera? Yeah, I have a couple times where I thought I could. Uh, no, I, a couple times, a couple different directors have asked me if I do a cameo on their on their thing, and uh, I did. I did a couple. Not very good. It's a reason to go behind the scenes. Yeah. Be back here next time for the conclusion of my five-part conversation with the great Bud York, and he dishes on a number of stories, and we'll find out how he made his way from the real world to the science fiction universe of Blade Runner. You've come this far, you'll want to hear the rest. For now, I'm David Levin. Thanks for watching.